Well, again, this evening we continue our study on the Holy Spirit, one of the most popular subjects in the religious world. There are so many things that are said on this subject that are just not true. And therefore, there is a great, great deal of confusion about the Spirit and His work today. And so what we've been trying to do in our Sunday evening services for uh, a few uh, of those services is to delve into exactly what the text says. And uh, we are now in the uh, third, uh, third of the uh, handouts, and I hope you have them. They're numbered the, on the top right-hand corner. You, uh, I hope, have a number three, which uh, gives you the idea of where we will be going uh, t- tonight. I will be looking at 35 of the passages down to Romans chapter 8. You'll notice uh, as you look at that outline, there are many of the passages using the word spirit in Romans chapter 8. In fact, uh, I counted 21 different times. This is obviously the chapter of the Holy Spirit, if you will. And uh, we won't deal with that one uh, this week, but Lord willing, we will uh, next Sunday evening and the rest of the uh, rest of the sheet that you have before you. Let me review for just a few moments uh, a couple of things. Number one, we are looking here at the places in the New Testament where the word spirit occurs. Now, not all of them are talking about the Holy Spirit. We've made the point that you have at times the word spirit referring to the human spirit. We'll find some of that tonight in, in these verses we'll be looking at. Secondly, there are evil spirits, and uh, we'll be seeing uh, a few of the places where that kind of use is in the text. And then thirdly, of indeed the Holy Spirit of God, and uh, we will see a number of places tonight where that's the case. So those three, uh, we won't spend a lot of time with the individual human spirit now with the evil spirits because our major thrust is on uh, the Holy Spirit. Second thing that I want to review for just a moment is the, the word reception is used of three different receivings or receptions if you will of the Holy Spirit in the first century. First of all there was the reception of the with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It'll be in one of the texts tonight. And that's when the, the uh, Holy Spirit came on upon from above upon human, various human beings. I use the head to remember that one because it, it comes from above upon the people involved. And then there is the reception with the laying on of the apostles' hands. We will see that tonight where miraculous spiritual gifts are given to the uh, uh, certain individuals, disciples of Christ. And then thirdly, the, the one, uh, and, and remember that with hands, the, the apostles' hands, uh, with, the, with the gifts given to various individuals. And then finally, think of your heart and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the, in the uh, uh, life of, of a Christian. And again, we'll see that, and we'll see it a lot more as we go into uh, the, the epistles and look at the, uh, the remainder of the New Testament. All right, let's, uh, let's start now at the very beginning. Uh, in chapter 11, verse 24, it describes a man named Barnabas, a wonderful Christian man that had a lot of influence in the early church. And he is described as a good man full of, of the Holy Spirit and uh, faith. We have said many times that you cannot say exactly what that filled or full of the Holy Spirit means. You have to look at each passage and look at its context. Here, obviously, uh, is, is a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Well, if you have faith, what, what will be happening? Will you, people will see the evidence of that. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit... They will see that you are uh, that you are guided by the the principles and the 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 revelation that has been given by the Holy Spirit. So it's always evidence. In fact, the very next verse makes the point that uh, a great work was done in the area where uh, Barnabas was located at that time. 
So uh, again, just speaking of a great man of God, there's nothing miraculous or mysterious about what he was doing with that church. He was just working hard and, and being a very spiritual man. Uh, cha same chapter, verse 28. And through the Spirit, a prophet by the name of Agabus, if you look it up in the text, uh, this prophet Agabus, through the Spirit, predicted a severe famine uh, that would spread uh, through the area of uh, what we would call probably the Promised Land or Canaan or Palestine. And so the, the early church decided to help with uh, uh, that, dealing with that famine down in the uh, uh, land of, uh, uh, associated even still today with the Jews. Chapter 13, verse 2. They were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and the Holy Spirit then speaks to the group in some way. And uh, this is the beginning of the command to start the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Of course, he takes along Barnabas, and so again, a, a great evangelistic movement started guided, directed by the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, he will be involved over and over again in the missionary work of the early church. And then uh, after that, uh, chapter 13, 4, the two of them, and this would be, of course, Paul and Barnabas, or, uh, and uh, uh, it says uh, they were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, uh, again directed and guided by the Spirit as they make that journey as they start this great adventure for the Lord uh, and uh, again guided by the Spirit as you'll see uh, uh, clearly as we move down through these passages in Acts. Chapter 13 verse 9, uh, Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit and looked uh, straight at this uh, false teacher, this false prophet, uh, and he said, and, and, and the point is here, uh, Paul is confronting this false teacher and, and some dramatic things happen because of this. But uh, Paul was filled by the Spirit and told the man that he would be going blind for opposing the uh, Christian message that Paul uh, was presenting. Chapter 13, verse 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Well, how would that... Uh, be evidence. Well, they would obviously be happy, as, happy, joyous people. And if they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they would uh, show that they were being influenced by good and by, by holy principles and by following the direction of the Holy Spirit. And again, there is uh, nothing here mysterious about uh, this particular filling. And it's important, again, as we said, look at the context. Chapter 15, verse 8, and I want to read this one, and I hope you have your New Testament, and I want to read uh, from uh, Acts 15, not just verse 8, but seven, uh, verse 7, 8, and 9. Now, this is a review of what happened in Acts 10 and 11. You know, it's hard, as I've said before, to exaggerate the importance of what happened in Acts chapter 10 and then 11, as it's sort of reviewed and, and restated. Because in chapter 10, you have the introduction of the gospel to a Gentile family um, centered in a man named Cornelius. And uh, it's, uh, it's a critical moment in the history of the church. Is Christianity just to be for Jews? Well, no. But it takes a long time for the Jewish Christians to, to, to realize this. And at chapter 10, there's that clear, definite demand that the Lord wants the gospel open, not just to Jews, but to the Gentile world. And that's why there's so much about it in Acts 10 and 11. Now here in Acts 15, you have the issue coming up again you have a problem still with some of the Jews thinking this is not right. The, the Gentiles need to sort of make a detour through Judaism to come to Christ. And uh, so they have this big conference in Jerusalem 
And Peter speaks, Paul speaks, James speaks. I mean, it's a big, big thing. Here's what Peter says in explaining about what happened earlier in 10 and uh, 11. Again, uh, from Acts 15, 7, beginning. And when there was much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them, okay, here we are, the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. No distinction. And, and how was that evidenced? By the simple fact that the Holy Spirit was given to them as it was to us. Us when? Well, on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, the Jewish apostles. Now he's reviewing the simple fact that a second time in history, the baptism with the Holy Spirit occurred and it was on the household of Cornelius and the point was not for salvation directly, but simply to demonstrate and show to the Jewish Christians that Gentiles were welcome in to the family of God and uh, they could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved just as the Jews had been doing for a number of years. And I, 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 I can't say that enough. I, I can't emphasize that enough because, again, there's so much in, in misinformation about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you this. We will not see another thing about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, oh, it's past. It's gone. Nothing else in the rest of the New Testament will have anything to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It happened twice. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, you remember there were two baptisms. The Holy Spirit baptism and then the baptism with water, Acts 2.38, for the remission of sins. And in Acts 10, with the household of Cornelius, there were two baptisms. One was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then after that, uh, Peter says... Uh, how could we bid, forbid water that these should not be baptized? It was a, the water baptism, the same that you had in Acts 2.38. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5 says, There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That Holy Spirit baptism was for a, two specific purposes in the book of Acts, and then it passed off the scene forever to be done with. It, it, it achieved the purposes that God had for it, and then we move past it. And today, as Ephesians 4, 5 said, a few years after the, the experiences with the baptism with the Holy Spirit, there is one baptism, and that is the baptism that we are under today and that we obey here 2,000 years later because it's for the remission of sins. It washes away our sins, Acts uh, chapter 22, verse 16. So um, it's a, a, a very important to understand what uh, Peter is saying in review here. Uh, chapter uh, 15, verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with, and, and this is in the context of a letter that the... Uh, that conference with the group uh, that had met there in Jerusalem um, to uh, send out to the Gentile Christians and letting them know you are to be accepted, you, are, you, you can obey the gospel just like we did. They, they name a few things that they would say you, you ought not to be doing these things, especially because it'll create barriers between us, but you can go ahead and, and, and be fully accepted into the family of God with us. And, and that's the point of that. But notice uh, uh, as, as we pass here, 
uh, the, uh, the uh, point in verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to bother you with these things. Notice it makes the point that this is not just something that we as a group of people would decide, human beings with our human ideas, but the Holy Spirit was involved in that conference, if you will. And so when it was finished and the letter was sent, the Holy Spirit again was guiding and directing and involved in the process of communicating this uh, very important thing happening here. In Acts 16, then, we move on, and it says in 16 and 17, the Lord, the, the Holy Spirit was guiding the work of the Apostle Paul. In fact, the point was made that, that he wanted to go into a certain area, a certain province, but it says the, uh, he was kept from doing that by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, for some reason, did not want uh, Paul to go immediately into a certain area to preach. It doesn't tell us why. Chapter, seven, uh, of chapter 16, verse 7, you have the same point. Uh, the, 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 the Spirit uh, did not allow them to go into this area. So they move on to another place and uh, some things begin to happen. Chapter 16, verse 16, uh, mentions a, 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 a evil spirit in the situation there, a girl uh, had an evil spirit or had a spirit uh, which had the, gave her the ability to predict the future. Uh, she becomes a, a nuisance to the Apostle Paul. And so in verse 18, uh, he, he was so troubled by her, uh, her uh, involvement uh, that uh, he turned around and said to the spirit, that is that evil spirit within the girl, come out, and, and of course, that's uh, exactly what happened. Uh, chapter 17, verse 16, you have in the New International Version, and, and that's the, the, kind, the, the text that we've used for these uh, verses, uh, and because it's the only place I found where we could, we could uh, uh, have all the places where uh, the word spirit is used. Uh, you have in the NIV, uh, to me, a, a mistranslation, it should be much, much clearer. Uh, but uh, 1716 in the, in the uh, uh, New International Version says, he was greatly distressed. Well, really what that text is saying is his spirit, that is his human spirit, was very distressed by what was going on. Paul's spirit is mentioned in the passage and, and not just he should be uh, in the text. So the human spirit is, is the one mentioned at this point. Chapter 18, verse 25 says, uh, he spoke with great fervor. And uh, uh, this is talking about the great uh, eloquent preacher, Apollos. And uh, notice he spoke with great fervor. Well, again, in the original text, the word spirit is there, our, our word pneuma. And it's talking about his human spirit. He he was fervent in spirit and was uh, communicating in a very eloquent and enthusiastic way the message that uh, he believed. Chapter 19, if you have your Bible, would you turn over there? I want to spend some time with uh, chapter 19 uh, to clarify some things that are very commonly misunderstood. Uh, in chapter 19, I want to look at uh, uh, verses 1 through 6. First of all, it says that Paul uh, came to the city of Ephesus, verse 1, and he found some disciples there. I think them to be disciples of Christ, but they are not fully informed. They have had, uh, uh, even though may, they may be believers and they know something about Christ, they don't know uh, some things that need to be corrected. But he found them in Ephesus, the great uh, Roman city of Ephesus. Uh, and uh, verse 2, he asked them a question in verse 2. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, what is he asking there? Is he asking, did they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that, can, that comes to every believer as uh, a, a baptized believer, as you find in Acts 2, verse 38? He wouldn't be asking that because 
obviously that, that happens. That, that's automatic, if you will. When you repent and are baptized, Acts 2.38 says, you have two promises. Number one, you have remission or forgiveness of sins. And number two, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, he would not have had, had to uh, really ask about that one. It would have been a given. So what he is talking about is the reception, as, as we said a few moments ago, of the giving of, of spiritual gifts by the laying on of some apostles' hands. Did you receive that? Well, uh, uh, he uh, will later on, with his apostles' hands, give spiritual gifts to these men. But that's later on. Well, they answer, though, in verse 3, uh, or, or at the end of verse 2, we haven't so much as heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So they don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Well, immediately, Paul knows their baptism is not correct. They would have encountered the Holy Spirit in two things. Number one, with the, the idea of the two promises we just mentioned, gift of the Holy Spirit being one, and also how in, in what we are baptized today, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they would have recognized, uh, if they had been correctly baptized, Something of the Holy Spirit, but they're saying, we don't, know, we don't know what you're talking about. And so, that second question is, is uh, from Paul. Verse 3, into what were you baptized? Into what were you baptized? Well, they say, into John's baptism. Uh, John's baptism, obviously, was earlier than the Lord's. And by the way... Notice the assumption and the connection Paul makes with believe in baptism. If they believed, they'd be baptized, if you look at this text. If they believed, they'd be baptized. Well then, notice once they say into John's baptism, then Paul needs to instruct them more. We do a lot of this today in, in uh, Bible studies that we have. Someone has been baptized in a way not scriptural, then we need to teach them more so they'll come to a full knowledge of what Christian baptism is. And that's exactly what Paul does here. Verse 4, uh, he makes the point that John's baptism looked forward to Christ Jesus and his coming. True Christian baptism would be after uh, his, uh, his coming, his death, and his pro the proclamation of him becoming the Messiah. Well, once they hear that, verse 5, they respond. And they respond by, and when it says, when they heard, they were baptized. How? Well, now, correctly, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's not John's baptism now. That's Christian baptism in the name of Jesus Christ or by his authority. And then verse 6, notice what happens in verse 6. After that is taken care of, after we've dealt with and corrected uh, the baptism, now this apostle, with his unique ability, lays his hands on these men, these 12 men, and guess what happens? He laid his hands upon them, and they began to prophesy, and to speak in tongues. Those are spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. At verse 10, you have both of these mentions, speaking in tongues and prophesying. And uh, there are, that's in a list of the other spiritual gifts given. But again, notice directly here how they were given. After the laying on of an apostle's hands, and that's what we have consistently seen throughout our time together in dealing with uh, the book of Acts, uh, uh, especially here. Um, let, me, let me see if I can deal with John's baptism in, in making uh, uh, our understanding clear about them. And let me track it for just a moment and then we'll move on. Apollos had been in Ephesus before Paul. Chapter 18, verse 24. He had known only the baptism of John. 
And then later on, in chapter 19, 1, where we have this text beginning, it makes the additional point that Apollos went on to Corinth. We can infer from that that Apollos taught these 12 men in the city of Ephesus. And he is probably like the 12 apostles and the 120 that you find in Acts chapter 1 that uh, were baptized with John's baptism, but then uh, were not, did not need to be re-baptized, baptized again after uh, the establishment of the church and, and the new covenant begins and so on. Uh, but, but it seems that, that Apollos uh, had experienced that before, but he had just been in Ephesus and had taught these 12 which is now after the ending of the effectiveness of John's baptism and only the one baptism of uh, of, uh, Christian baptism uh, would would be effective and would be uh, the thing to do. And so, again, these 12 needed to be re-baptized. And uh, I think that makes uh, uh, more sense of anything that you will uh, look at with that uh, particular baptism in mind. All right, uh, let's move on to chapter 19, verse 12, and 13, and 15, and 16. You are dealing with uh, uh, some people that were demon-possessed, it it said, or that have an evil spirit. And again, we're not dealing primarily with that, but of course, uh, the the power of God was involved in that and confronting that... uh, those evil spirits. So we won't, we won't deal with uh, that, uh, those passages. Uh, and then it says that Paul, and, and again, this is the New International Version at 1921. It says Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. Well, what the text really says is Paul purposed in the spirit, in the spirit. Now, did, it, did he purpose in the Spirit in, with a capital S, in other words, with the Holy Spirit directly guiding him, or did he, in his own human spirit, determine the direction and going and doing this? I can't tell you. Some, some translations will have a capital S for the Holy Spirit, and some will have a small s. I can't, I can't uh, tell you, and we, we could argue about that all day long, but... Uh, purposing or the, de- the, the decision was made and this man now is moving on in his, uh, in his ministry. Chapter 20, verse 22, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. This is Paul saying, I must go to Jerusalem no matter what. Uh, and and the, the, Spirit is, uh, the Spirit is guiding me here. Uh, chapter uh, 20, verse 23, I only know that in every city, The Holy Spirit uh, warns me that prison awaits me. But again, uh, he uh, uh, there is that that working with the Spirit and and guiding him and 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 moving him toward this uh, objective. Chapter twenty, verse twenty-eight is talking to elders, elders from the great city of Ephesus. Uh, Paul meets them at a place called Miletus, and uh, he says this of them that you are responsible for all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. In God's plan, the plan given by revelation of the Spirit, uh, the, the process of leadership is placed in the hands of overseers. Uh, that's a word that could be also translated bishops and other places. They're called pastors and elders. But the point is that... that uh, uh, positioning, that placing of people in leadership places is unique and very much a part of the overseeing, guiding process of the Holy Spirit. And we still have that today. When men are qualified and are respected and admired and a, lead, a, 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 a congregation uh, desires them to serve as their leaders, then uh, uh, it is still the case that that. Uh, The Holy Spirit has uh, uh, become a part of that. Chapter 21, verse 4. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. In other words, this is inspired revelation. 
they're, they're, they're being, they're encouraging him, don't go. But of course, he will be going. Um, uh, one of the, the prophets uh, went through a symbolic thing. Uh, it's telling him that uh, the Holy Spirit says, don't go. But again, Paul re- wants to go and, and, and be in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Rome. And so he continues his journey. Chapter 23, verse 8. Uh, This is a description of the beliefs of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe basically in the supernatural. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't think about there being a a resurrection. Uh, The Sadducees would be modernists today if we were giving them a title. Uh, on the other hand, the Pharisees were very conservative and, and believed in the thing, those things, angels and, 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 uh, the spirit and spirits and resurrection. And Paul used that disagreement and conflict between those two religious parties to actually uh, make uh, a, a, a means of him uh, uh, becoming less... Uh, uh, less uh, 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 of a problem for them and, and, and a problem for himself. And, and you can read the context of, uh, of this and see what I'm talking about. Um, then uh, you, you have, uh, again, chapter 23, 9, the same point. Uh, the Pharisees take his side in this. Chapter 28, verse 25, the last uh, chapter of the uh, of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said, and the passage here is from the book of Isaiah, and the point is that the Holy Spirit was speaking through this prophet, and that's what we've seen over and over again the the affirmation from the sacred text that that uh, the Holy Spirit was guiding those those uh, writers of the Bible. David, of course, we've seen before, and various other prophets have, were, were affirmed to be writing with the influence and guidance uh, of the Holy Spirit. All right, a couple more, and then, then we'll close the lesson. Romans chapter 1, verse 4 uh, says uh, that Jesus Christ, who through the Spirit of holiness was declared with power to you. So in other words, the Holy Spirit was involved in the proclamation of the word. And you cannot escape that, certainly as you look at at the book of Acts and and throughout the New Testament after the day of Pentecost. Uh, 1-9 is an example of the human spirit that we uh, talked about a few moments ago. Chapter 1, verse 9, when I serve with my whole heart, the NIV says, but that's the word pneuma, the Greek word for spirit. But it's the human spirit. And he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm totally committed to this. My heart is involved in it. My, my spirit's involved in this. I am committed to this cause. Uh, chapter 2, verse 29. This is making a contrast between the new covenant that is described as, as being uh, of the spirit and not of the letter. The letter being a, 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 a symbolic way of talking about the old law. And he makes this point, you'll notice uh, uh, is, uh, the, what, you, what the new covenant is, is circumcision of the heart by the spirit and not the, the NIV says written code, but the, the exact word is the letter. The, the, the letter of the old law. We don't live under that anymore. And he's making that so clear in this passage. That's true also in chapter 7, verse 6. We've been uh, released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. So you have the contrast with the, the letter uh, of the, the old law and you have the life in the Spirit. Totally different ways of dealing with, uh, with religion. And... Uh, that's uh, affirmed in this passage. And so uh, that we, uh, uh, we don't serve with the oldness of the letter. In other words, with the old law, that's finished. 
Now we are under, as and what he says in, in chapter 8, uh, verse 2, the, the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus. So we, we are under uh, rule. We are under law, but it's a different kind of law completely uh, than the, the old law of Moses. Thank you for sharing this with me tonight. I appreciate uh, your attention and, and your interest in this. And um, again, we'll continue this next time and, and spend uh, uh, a, a, a number of uh, minutes with this um, uh, Romans chapter 8. It's a beautiful passage. A lot of people have asked, well, what does the Holy Spirit do for us today with that indwelling of the Spirit? Well, this uh, Romans chapter 8 is one of, the, one of the places to look at that. And we'll find some wonderful things that are beneficial to us because the Spirit dwells in us and, and does the things that, that He does. There may be someone here tonight that would like to be baptized into Christ. As we said earlier, there are two promises. If you, as a believer, are willing to repent of your sins and be baptized, you can have the forgiveness of every sin of your past. Isn't that amazing? And then you can have the gift of the indwelling spirit within you. It's not something miraculous. It's not something mysterious and uh, still small voice or whatever. But it is, as we will talk about later, that, uh, that that does so much for us. And if you'd like to become a New Testament Christian and have your past sins forgiven, won't you come now while together we stand and sing?